Um, yeah, first of all, I wanted to um, put the flesh flies within a context so that flesh flies are a family, sarcophagids, sarcophagidae, and I wanted to put them into the broader context of diptera. So I apologize to any of our listeners who already know a lot about diptera, but I thought it was better for um, everyone else to have a, a more of a overview of where the family fits within the order. So diptera, also known as true flies, are one of the four large insect orders, holometabolous insect orders, with about 160,000 described species worldwide and over 7,000 species in the UK. They are classified within holometabola um, as part of a group named the Antliophora, which contains so the diptera, the true flies, and the fleas and scorpion flies, which form a group which is sister to the to the true flies. And um, this the class the relationships between these groups um, is uh, being still being uh, studied, but um, this tree I'm presenting here is uh, quite recent uh, study based on genomic data. What uh, differentiates true flies from other insects? Well, the main feature is that they only have one pair of wing. Um, so they have two wings in total, hence the name from the Greek Diptera. And the second pair of wing is reduced to form what we call the halter. Um, the halter is uh, an, an organ, so a modified wing, which uh, allows uh, flies to keep good balance during flies, during, during flight. And diptera diversity is actually thought to be possibly quite uh, grossly underestimated. Um, just based on a, a study of the Canadian fauna, um, Hebert et al. in 2016 estimated that there were, there could be up to 16,000 different species of gall midges, Cecidomyde, just in Canada alone, which would mean that the potentially the family could have up to 1.8 million species worldwide. And similar estimates exist for other uh, very speciose families of, of diptera. Of course, these, these seem to be huge numbers. So they, they, that would mean there would be more gall midges than species of insects described so far. But it may be an exaggeration, but there is definitely more species out there to, to be discovered. One of the reasons of this success is the high specialization of, of, of the larvae. So like in all holometabolous insects or in most holometabolous insects, the, the larvae have a very different uh, life mode from the adults and they're often highly specialized also morphologically. So um, no diptera larvae have true legs. Some of them have a head, head capsule, particularly the aquatic species. And um, in the higher diptera groups, uh, the head is lost altogether um, and is basically reduced to a pair of mandibles with which they, they feed through whichever substrate they live in. Um, this means that the, the larvae are mostly adapted for feeding. This is the feeding stage of, of these insects. And they have evolved to feed in a high number of substrates. In fact, to um, quote uh, Grimaldi and Engel, uh, diptera are probably the most ecologically diverse group of insects. And just a few examples of the modes of life. They contain many uh, groups which are decomposers and scavengers, 
on both vegetable matter and animal matter, uh, groups which feed on live plants, uh, leaf miners, stem miners, for example, and uh, species which are associated with other animals, in particular other invertebrates. And the list is long, so we have uh, insect associates, kleptoparasites, and various forms of, of parasites or parasitoids or predators, depending on the definitions of these terms. As adults, uh, diptera usually have a quite different mode of life compared to their larvae. Um, some don't feed at all, so others are predators, others feed on flowers, and this also includes uh, species which are pollinators. Um, others feed on uh, feces and carrion, so they can be vectors of uh, pathogens, and others have adapted quite strongly like the case of this bat fly in the image to be ectoparasitic on uh, mammals or birds. Some adults are famously or infamously uh, blood suckers, so mosquitoes, black flies, etc. We go back to the theme of pollination. Uh, it's been shown that diptera are some of the most uh, prevalent pollinators aside from bees and uh, just to quote some in data from the UK uh, Steve Falk in 2019 estimated that there are about 1,500 spe species of diptera which uh, pollinate uh, uh, one or more uh, species of plants. This also includes uh, sarcophages. Um, as adults, sometimes fly, the adult flies have adapted quite extremely to their environment and don't really look like flies at all anymore. Um, one example here is the terrible hairy fly, which hit the news a few years ago because it was rediscovered after several decades in a, from a, a cave in Kenya where this species feeds on piles of bat guano. As you can see, the adult has very reduced eyes, very reduced wings and long legs, and it's basically adapted to run around very fast uh, on, on the surface of, of these guano piles. Similarly, um, ectoparasitic uh, flies in the, the hyperboscid, in the louse fly group, so including nictiri beads or bat flies, they have completely lost their vision and their flight and they basically live their whole existence on the, uh, on, on the fur of, of, of their hosts. Here are two more examples of some female flies in the family Foridae, scuttle flies. Um, this on the right is, believe it or not, an adult female. These species have uh, evolved um, to uh, live um, their whole during their whole life cycle within uh, termite uh, nests, and they have uh, adapted, they, they basically mimic the, the termites in their shape so that they, they won't get attacked by termite uh, soldiers. Just a bit of Guinness Book of Records regarding flies. Um, some, some flies can reach up to seven centimeters. These are uh, tropical species in the families Pantophthalmidae and uh, Mididae. Uh, whereas the world's smallest fly was discovered only a couple of years ago, um, breaking a previous record from the same family. This is also a scuttle fly um, and it's uh, less than half a millimeter long. And as you can see, also strongly adapted for possibly some type of uh, parasitic uh, lifestyle. I even used this species to make my own physical distancing meme in the early stages of the, of the pandemic. Uh, don't know how many people were able to appreciate it, but it would take over 5,000 of these flies to ensure a safe distance between people. 
So looking at the, the Diptera tree of life, going into the classification a bit, um, the Diptera are divided into two main groups, the Nematocera, so crane flies, mosquitoes, midges, etc., and the Brachycera, which are the, 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 the more uh, sturdy looking flies with shorter antennae. Uh, within the Brachycera, um, there's a large uh, lineage called the Schizophora, uh, which include uh, the flesh flies, which I will be talking about later on. Um, these, this uh, group is uh, defined by um, having this suture just above the antennae, so it's like a scar, which is left by uh, this sac which allows the fly the, to emerge from its puparium after metamorphosis. So these, this group of flies have evolved, have evolved this very uh, special way of getting out of the puparium once they've transformed into an adult. And within a few uh, hours after emergence, this sac, which, um, which allows to, pull, to push open the puparium, gets reabsorbed within the head. Um, within the Schizophora, uh, there are two main lineages, the acalyptrates and the calyptrates. The calyptrates are recognizable by having these squamy at the base of the wing, so known as calyptors, whereas the acalyptrates don't have this feature. And within the calyptrates, there are other uh, characters which allow to distinguish from the acalyptrates. So we have a, a complete transfer suture across the thorax. We have uh, what's called the greater, oh, sorry, ampulla um, just below the wing, which is a kind of protuberance just below the wing. And there's also a difference in the second antennal segment with, a, again, a, a longitudinal suture, which is not present in the acalyptrates. Within the calyptrates, we have three superfamilies, Hippoboscoide, which include the louse flies and the tetsi flies. Most of them are ectoparasitic and blood-sucking species, although tetsi flies are free-living. Muscoids, so Muscoidea, the house, the house fly family and relatives. Um, most people will be familiar with house flies and also with dung flies. And then the third superfamily, the Estroidea, to which the flesh flies belong, contains uh, several families, including the bot flies, uh, blow flies, uh, wood louse flies, and parasitic flies, or tachinidae. How to distinguish Muscoidea from Estroidea? Uh, well, uh, it's mostly down to a couple of characters, although there are exceptions. But the uh, Estroidea have a row of what we call hyperpleural or mural bristles, just in this lateral segment of the thorax between the, the second and the, and the third pairs of legs. And they also have usually a very conspicuous bend in the end vein. There are exceptions. so. If, for a, for a start, Musca domestica has a, a bend in the M-vein, and there are some uh, muscoids with hyperpleural bristles, but that's, those are general pointers to the distinction between the two superfamilies. Okay, so within the estroids, um, there have been several different um, studies looking at relationships within these groups of flies and the relationships keep changing and as we add more data, particularly now molecular data, um, these relationships are, becoming to, are beginning to become more stable. Most recent uh, genomic data is uh, pointing to a sister group relationship between the sarcophages, so the flesh flies, and the bot flies within the estroidia. Which brings us to the flesh flies, the main topic of this talk. Um, this is a well, well corroborated monophyletic family. 
uh, they vary in size between about three and 20, over 20 millimeters. They're usually quite stout, sturdy looking, and the females are usually viviparous, which I will get back to later. It basically means that they give birth to live young rather than lay eggs. And overall, there's a, a kind of overwhelming convergence of the species in this family towards a, a quite a standard uh, uh, coloration of the body. So black and gray with a striped thorax and a checkered abdomen. Families divide, divided into three subfamilies, miltogramins, also known as satellite flies, with about 700 species, paramacronychines, about 100 species, and the sarcophagine, with over 2,000 species. Within the sarcophagina, the largest genus is by far the genus uh, Sarcophaga, which is mostly distributed in the old world. Um, there is a hypothesis according to which the family, or at least the subfamily Sarcophagina, may have originated in the New World and uh, probably in South America or possibly. And from there, um, would have reached the old world by um, dispersing through uh, the Bering Strait and then throughout the old world. So the hypothesis is that the, the subfamily diversified um, early on during its evolution in, uh, in the near tropics and a few uh, lineages got out of the new world into the old world and um, occupied uh, niches which were probably not occupied yet in the old world and so these these few lineages that came across uh, diversified very quickly um, which explains the, the large number of species in the, in the genus sarcophaga. Uh, lots of them just look have this classic um, look, uh, black and gray striped thorax and checkered abdomen. But there are also here some exceptions. There's some quite stunning, stunningly colored um, sarcophaga species, particularly in uh, Pacific islands. Um, some of them have darkened wings or colored wings. Others have uh, patterns on their wings. So that's true for a few um, of the Afrotropical species. Another large genus in the old world is the genus Blesoxypha. Um, most species are parasitoids of uh, grasshoppers or orthopteroids in general. And there's actually one of the few or only known metallic uh, sarcophagid species is in the, the genus Blesoxypha. And this is a species from, uh, a still undescribed species from, which was recently discovered in Madagascar. Uh, another large genus in the Neotropics is the genus Pekia. It pretty much um, takes up the, the ecological niche which sarcophaga has in the old world, in the new world. Um, we also have uh, the genus Oxysarcodexia, which is um, uh, also quite diverse in the old world with a few species which have spread uh, um, as invasives uh, to other continents. And in this group, there are a few species with asymmetric male genitalia, which is quite uh, rare to find in, in insects in general. So the family Miltogramine, they're quite, they look quite different from the typical flesh flies. They look a bit more like tachinids, and most of them are uh, kleptoparasitic um, in uh, nests of uh, solitary wasps and solitary bees. They're more diverse in the northern hemisphere, at least we think they are and they are usually attached to dry habitats and 
like sandy habitats in which their hosts are most diverse. And they also come in quite uh, uh, different uh, appearances. Depending on the, on the genus, they're really quite diverse in terms of their morphology. They sometimes have some very weird uh, adaptations, such as these long uh, thoracic CT. Sometimes they're quite, they have bright, brightly colored silver heads and they can, they vary quite a lot in size as well from just a few millimeters up to over a centimeter. Often they have, they're quite well camouflaged against their background. So when in duny sandy habitats, these flies are actually very, very difficult to spot and collect if, if that's your purpose. The third subfamily, Paramacolnichine, they look more like um, sarcophagine flesh flies, quite similar and they include some also all sorts of um, biologies but they also include some species which are true uh, parasites in the larval stage of vertebrates. This is Brachycoma divia, looks a lot like a sarcophaga, so it can fool collectors or photographers quite a lot. And slightly darker looking Nictia alterata. Both these last two species also occur in the UK. As regards relationships between the subfamilies, um, based on morphological information, it, for a long time, um, the Miltogramine were considered uh, basal to, to the, the other two uh, subfamilies, which are which were considered sister groups. However, recent uh, molecular data is pointing to a sister group relationship between the Miltogramine and the Paramaconicine uh, instead, and this seems to be confirmed in uh, by several independent studies. In terms of their biology, the biology is also extremely diverse. Um, they're mostly uh, scavengers or feeding on, on small uh, invertebrates, either dead or alive. And there's one uh, feature which characterizes the family, and that is that the egg stage is, uh, is not external, so the, the, the females in, in related families, such as the blowflies, which are depicted here, deposit egg masses, which hatch after several days or several hours, at least after being laid. Whereas uh, flesh fly females incubate the eggs within their uterus and they release them pretty much when they're ready to hatch or have already hatched. So they basically skip the the, the egg stage, which is quite a vulnerable stage to predation, and um, they, they can be con they're considered uh, they're termed larviparous, which or viviparous or ovo larviparous, when um, the eggs hatch, either during deposition or shortly after deposition, like a few seconds or a few minutes. This, this can vary across the family. Some species actually lay eggs, but these eggs will always be fully incubated and, and pretty much ready to hatch. And normally the females wait until they found a suitable substrate before releasing their, their young. But most often, in, at least in the genus Sarcophaga, they give birth to, to live uh, first instar larvae. But this has basically allowed them to be very quick at colonizing uh, small um, ephemeral um, food sources such as small uh, dead uh, insects or other invertebrates and some of them of course also feed on on, on large uh, carcasses but they're rarely the most dominant uh, species within these carcasses, which are usually dominated by um, blowflies, which lay uh, huge numbers of eggs. 
So this is what we, we think may have led to the diversity in this family. It's, it's to have adapted with this uh, um, egg, internal egg incubation to a small uh, carrion strategy. So um, they, they possibly, um, they shifted from uh, feeding on dead um, substrates to feeding on live substrates. So several species uh, are predators or parasitoids, depending on the definition of, uh, of other invertebrates. The difference uh, normally between when, when we define a species, a parasitoid or a predator, is that parasitoids are usually feeding on a single host, whereas predators will finish feeding on one host and then move on to the other one. So it also depends on the host. We actually don't really know enough about uh, the biology of lots of species to be able to say with certainty whether a majority of these flesh flies are parasitoids, true parasitoids, or whether they're predators. But um, the ones which feed on other, uh, the ones which we're not entirely sure how to define, they feed on a huge variety of different invertebrates, so snails, earthworms, millipedes, spider egg sacs, moth pupae, bumblebees, honeybees, and the list is actually much, much, much longer. Um, one characteristic is that some species seem to be quite generalist and they can feed both on the live tissues and on dead tissues. So we think that maybe they choose uh, hosts which are either sick or dying uh, rather than fully uh, healthy hosts. There are also some true parasitoids within the, the family. So for example, the genus Blizzoxifa, which feeds on uh, grasshoppers, but also beetles, um, where studies have shown that they, they definitely feed only on one host and are quite specialized in their feeding mode. And then the last uh, major feeding habit is in the family Miltogramini, which are kleptoparasitic which basically means that they steal uh, another species food resource. In this case, they feed inside the nests of uh, uh, solitary bees and wasps. And I will go into a bit more detail shortly about uh, how they do this. So we'll start with defining what kleptoparasitism is. Um, so I've, I've, just, I've just defined kleptoparasitism. It possibly evolved from a scavenger uh, uh, ground plan because um, many species are quite uh, unspecific when it comes to their hosts. Some of them can feed in, in the nests of, of various uh, species and they also feed on, on dead prey uh, when, when, when possible. Um, they are one of the, the main mortality factors of their hosts and they've co-evolved some very sophisticated behaviors uh, to get with their so they've co-evolved with their hosts to develop some very sophisticated uh, behaviors to to basically attack their nests and um, two authors in the 70s and 80s i believe uh, did a lot of research on these uh, on the different types of behavior in North America, and they divided the North American Miltogramians into three categories. The hole searchers, so the ones that search directly for the nests without really um, uh, looking at the, at the hosts themselves. And the satellites, which tend to follow the host around until they go back to their nests, and the stalkers and lurkers who try to um, lay their larvae on the host while on, on, on the host prey while the host is still outside the nest. This is an example of a satellite fly just hovering just above its, its um, specid host. Here you can see a fly uh, depositing or 
attempting to deposit presumably on the, the paralyzed host of Crabronid. And um, this is a case where the eggs haven't really completely hatched yet. Uh, they were, looks like they were just hatching after they'd been deposited. But there's one species of, of miltogramin, which occurs also in the UK, which actually sticks, glues its eggs to the side of the thorax of its host. Um, I have a short video here showing this behavior. So this is a, um, an amophilus, an amophiline sphercid wasp carrying a paralyzed caterpillar to its nest. The video is quite long, so I'll skip to, I'll fast forward to about here, where you see it's dug, it's, it's digging its nest, and you can see that there's some flies have appeared. So there's a fly here sitting on the pine cone, and there was one just that landed on the, on the caterpillar earlier. And you'll see that they they come back in a short while. See, there's a there's a female here, and it's just yeah in, in inspecting the nest. And now it's landed here, and the the wasp is definitely aware that there's a parasite around, so it doesn't look too happy. And if we fast forward again to around here, you will see that in the end the the wasp decides that it's not a good spot because there are too many flies around and she she's thinking about it but she walks off with her caterpillar to find a more suitable spot although i'm not sure how lucky she will be so some um some studies have shown that up to 70 or 80 percent of the, of the wasp cells are get attacked by by the flies and because the wasp lays an egg and the flies lay larvae the larvae are uh, active right from the start and often one of the first things they do is they eat the they eat the wasps nest so that they don't have any competition for the food resource the the the, the wasps egg sorry Here's another video from the same author. It's a bit shorter one. You can see here there's a there's a fly waiting for the, the right moment to lay its larvae. The wasp is presumably beginning to fill in its nest so that it can at least protect it. It's dragging some small bits of sand into its nest. And the fly is just patiently waiting for the right moment. Then at one point towards the end, you'll see that the, so there's a, a jump in the, in the images. And so you see the fly is gradually getting closer to the, to the, to the nest. And here, but it's, you can see it's, it's laid its larvae right on the edge of the nest and they just wriggle and drop into the nest. So they will very quickly enter the, 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 the wasps, um, the wasp's uh, cell where she stored food for her young and oops sorry and and quite quickly uh, um, consume the, the forward there we go so other ecologies within uh, flesh flies so um one example of a, a predaceous species, um, so species in the genus Agria, they are um, they feed on the last instar larvae and chrysalises of ermine moth caterpillars, and these caterpillars um, congregate in these big uh, nests, and the flies lay there larvae on, on the surface of the nest, the, the larvae burrow into the nest and it's been uh, observed, some people have, have, have done some quite in-depth studies on the behavior in, in Italy, for example, 
and they've shown that they were able to observe that uh, one of the agria, one of the, the flesh fly larvae can just eat its way through up to 50 uh, caterpillar, uh, 50 ermine moth um, chrysalises before uh, developing into a full, fully fledged third instar larva. Um, within the uh, Paramacronychini, I mentioned uh, some species which are parasitic on vertebrates. So one famous example is the Mediterranean screw worm, where um, huge uh, larval masses can occur in either in natural orifices of uh, the animal's body. So this usually affects uh, um, uh, livestock, so for example, sheep or cattle, mainly sheep, or within wounds uh, on in the body. So, and they they don't kill the the host, but they can they can probably weaken it if if there's a, a big attack. But they're not they're, they're they're more strictly parasites, even though they're just they just do that in the larval stage. Um, one. Um, example uh, is feeding on earthworms. That's uh, a case where we're not sure whether they're, where we can define them as parasitoids or predators. Um, within the genus Sarcophaga, there are a few extremely common species, particularly in Europe. There are three, three subspecies in the UK, which are in the subgenus uh, Sarcophaga sensu stricto. Um, where the main, uh, if you look at the literature, they're mostly uh, said to feed on earthworms. Although there are some uh, records also from uh, uh, moth uh, pupae. Um, but then if you look more in depth at the literature, so recently I had a student who did a, a literature review on the subject of these flies feeding on earthworms. There are actually very, very few papers in which uh, any observations have been made. And so I think um, he came across just a handful of papers where they actually describe the, the feeding behavior or the, the larvae positing behavior of these flies on earthworms out of about four, four to 500 papers in which the that this, this ecology is mentioned. So only very few of them have actually described it. So we actually know still very little about what's going on. And during his project, my student um, was actually only able to find one. So that wasn't the main part of his project, but he also was looking for uh, affected earthworms. And he was collecting a few earthworms and then he, he managed to find one this one here, uh, you can see that the surface of the earthworm is not very regular. So there's some kind of uh, irregularities in the thickness. And that's probably already an indication that it's it had the larvae in it. Also, they seem to be slow and seem to move in um, not very logical directions. And um, sure enough, he put this uh, earthworm in a, in a jar. And after a few days, some uh, third instar uh, sarcophaga larvae emerged after having pretty much completely consumed the earthworm, which by then was dead. But when he collected it, the, the worm was, uh, was still alive. So this is the, one of the third instars after having emerged from the earthworm. Here it's burrowing into the soil to pupate, and this is one of the, the puparia. Um, a few years ago, um, some colleagues did uh, some lab experiments with these common species, and they were able to observe that the, the first instar larvae almost invariably uh, entered the earthworm through the, the clitellum. So there's a breathing hole here and they would choose that as like the weak spot to get into to the host. Okay. Um, 
that's just a good example to show that even with the most common species, so these are species which we which occur in our gardens, in our low, uh, urban parks, we still really don't know much about their biology. In fact, if you look at um, records in, in collections, most of the records are not from earthworms, but they're from uh, Lepidoptera pupae, because presumably there's more people who have been rearing uh, Lepidoptera than, than earthworms, and they've found uh, adult flies in their rearing cages, which have emerged from these pupae. So lots more needs to be done on, on the biology of these, of these species. Another large genus, Blesoxypha, as I said, they're, they're mostly parasitoids of grasshoppers. A few species are parasitoids of beetles. The females have, um, this is one of the cases where they, they're, they're more uh, ovo-larviparous than larviparous. So they, they lay eggs which hatch uh, probably shortly after having been deposited or during the process of, of deposition. And in fact, they have these, these hardened and sharp uh, ovipositors which, with which they pierce their hosts. And um, one of the most detailed works on this group was carried out by uh, Jacqueline Leonid, um, together with her husband. She did her doctoral thesis on this, um, on this genus and collected a whole lot of uh, information on the life cycles of various species, which also allowed her to associate males and females of species which so far were not had not been associated. So often the male or the female were described as, as, as a separate species until experimentally these people were these uh, they were allowed they were able to, to associate the sexes. They also did uh, uh, lots of SEM work, uh, and this is still one of the best reference works for, for the identification and, and study of the biology of, of this genus. Another nice example comes from North America, genus Emblemasoma. Um, this is a genus with a few species, one of which was known as a cicada parasitoid. And recently a second species was also confirmed as a cicada parasitoid. And you can see here the, the first instar entering the, 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 the live cicada and the third instar uh, exiting the cicada once it's, it's, it's died. Um, one very interesting thing about this this group is that the females uh, seem to uh, be able to locate uh, the cicadas, the, paras the, the host, via the, the acoustics. So they have ways of uh, recognizing the, the sound of their host and that's how they approach it rather than using chemical cues. Uh, going back to pollination, a couple of years ago, I, 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 I just came across this tweet in which a guy called Jorge from Chile said, why don't you guys use flies as pollinators of your carrot crops? And I don't know, it was, it was some thread about uh, crops. And it turns out that they use sarcophagid flies to pollinate their carrots and they set the flies free in the female carrot lines. So that was, I thought that was really cool. And I, I wasn't aware that that happened. I don't know if it's being used elsewhere outside of Chile or outside of this, this particular farm. How do we collect flesh flies? So it's a bit more practical information. So, um, there are many ways of collecting flying insects, uh, both passive and active, but uh, most collectors enjoy direct collecting with a, with a hand net. Um, and with 
Flesh flies, you don't need to sweep, the, you won't collect much by sweeping the vegetation unless there are poor uh, weather conditions. Normally you identify good spots in which to find the flies and then you, you pick them up uh, more or less one by one uh, with the net and, and, and collect them. So good spots are, for example, um, patches of sunlight uh, within a, a woodland or along paths, forest edges, and also hilltops. So in places where the, the habitat is very big and the, and the populations are dispersed, um, it's, um, many insects are known to use hilltopping as a way to uh, possibly probably find a mate. So the males uh, tend to congregate at the top of hills or other structures which are um, emerging from the landscape. These are a couple of famous hilltops in, uh, in, in Australia. Um, I was told that after the, um, one of the Diptra Congresses, which took place in Australia in the early 2000s, there were people at the bottom of this hilltop actually controlling the access to the top. So there were, there were people policing it and saying that there's already too many people up there already. People trying to push their way up. But yeah, I've, I've, I've experienced hilltopping myself. They are very good for flesh flies. So this, I collected uh, many specimens of a new species in Sardinia. On, on these rocks uh, close to the top of a hill. This is me in Turkey a few years ago. And you can easily spend a good part of the day, although the number of specimens uh, decreases towards the hotter hours of the day. But if you go up early in the morning, you can easily collect um, hundreds of specimens just from a few rocks. This is a hilltop in Cumbria, and it's not the safest of activities, I would say, especially if the hilltop is that narrow. Other good habitats, particularly for miltogramins, are, as I said, sandy dune habitats. Um, you don't really notice them at first, but if you start looking for them, they can be extremely abundant. But you need to be quick and you need to first um, kind of um, detect them on the sand despite their camouflage. And then usually the best way of collecting them is to actually uh, quickly put your net down onto the ground bef before they're able to fly away. Similarly, um, in savanna type habitats, um, you find lots or you can find lots of different species of miltogramins along these uh, sandy paths. Of course, dead things are very attractive to flesh flies, as their common name suggests. Then usually not the most abundant uh, uh, species in, uh, in dead uh, bodies. This is usually dominated by blowflies as I said, but you can still find the odd flesh fly, which are either interested in the smell as an adult, just feeding off the juices, or generally interested in, in laying their, their larvae in the substrate. Uh, this can lead to some quite funny uh, um, ways of collecting. So, oops, sorry. Here, I was on a field trip in Australia, and as you probably know, the Australian roads are littered by dead kangaroos and wallabies. And what my colleagues were doing here, it uh, looks like the scene are out of, out of some strange film. They are moving a dead kangaroo from one side of the road to the other so that then we can access it more easily in the afternoon and see if any interesting flies have come along. Kelly, who's looking a bit idle in this video, is actually, she, she did a full revision of Australian sarcophagus species 
published about seven papers from her PhD. So she made a huge contribution to uh, knowledge of, of the genus in, in, in Australia. Oh, I don't seem to be able to click forward after a video. This is just uh, another example of a, a nicely decomposed kangaroo from the same trip. Uh, sometimes uh, bait uh, can be hugely successful and even too successful. So, for example, in this video, we we had um, we had some rotting fish which we've been carrying around with us for days now. So, yeah, we had a good Tupperware. So. The smell wasn't too bad when we were driving to our next location, but as soon as we opened the box, this was the type of scene that we we got. Lots of blowflies, but also lots of uh, flesh flies, and we got a bit too excited by it because um, we focused a lot on that box of, of fish, and there's also dead. Um, this was a monitor lizard that we had collected from the size of the road. Uh, at the end of this video, you'll see you can get how you can easily get a net full of flies. And then trying to pick out the ones you're interested in is, can be quite uh, challenging. Then we brought like hundreds of specimens back to the um, hotel we were staying in from this trip and from this uh, particular site. And it turned out that they were all, they all belonged to the same species. So we were hoping that we were getting lots of interesting stuff, but it was one very common species. So that was one waste of a morning. Okay, so of course, uh, malaise traps can help you collect uh, more elusive species or rarer species, um, as well as yellow pan traps, they, they work very well for for sarcophages and many adult uh, flesh flies are attracted to flowers. So um, that's why uh, pan traps can be extremely effective. So now I get to the British sarcophages uh, and then uh, I will leave room for some quiz questions and then some questions from yourselves. Um, there are currently 65 species known from the UK, 18 Miltogramines, 6 Paramacronychines, and 41 Sarcophagine. This is about 20% of the European species. Um, British Isles have quite an impoverished fauna for some groups, particularly groups which prefer uh, hotter weather, but in recent years some uh, European species seem to be appearing in, in the UK. So maybe that could be due to uh, um, warmer temperatures, we, we, we still don't know. Or maybe some of them had been there for a long time and just been stayed undetected. These are the Miltogramin species, Paramacronychines, and within the Sarcophagine, the bulk are uh, sarcophaga species, which are distributed in subgenera as follows. So identification, very briefly, just touching upon the main characters which can help you people separate uh, the, the various subfamilies or genera. One of the, the first splits you usually find in keys is between the miltogramins and paramacronychines on one side and the sarcophagines on the other side. Um, where we have uh, some CT, some hairs on the posterior surface of the hind coxa, which all sarcophagine have and all members of the other subfamilies don't have. Then it's often, once you're looking at sarcophagine, uh, it's, it's usually very useful to quite quickly determine whether you have a male or a female. Uh, males have narrower uh, fronts, a narrow fo forehead, and the narrowest point of the forehead is uh, 
it uh, is kind of halfway between the vertex and the insertion of the antennae. Uh, in females, the, the, the forehead is uh, broader and it gets gradually broader from the base, from the vertex, all the way to the, to the front. And one important character to distinguish females from males is the presence of a couple of forward facing uh, bristles on the forehead. This is just for the subfamily sarcophagi. So within that subfamily, no males ever have these forward facing bristles on the head. Uh, other characters, for example, um, to distinguish the genera, in Bezoxifa and Ravinia, the males have uh, a comb of very thickened um, stout uh, bristles on the mid, the mid femur, so on the mid leg. Sarcophaga, sometimes they're slightly thickened and shortened, but they're never as stout as, as in Bezoxifa and Ravinia. Usually they look more like this. Uh, other characters within, within sarcophaga, uh, identification often relies heavily on characters of the genitalia, but there are other external characters which can help split into different groups of species. For example, the presence of these small CT on wing vein R1. I didn't have a good photo, close-up photo showing wing vein R1 without CT, but there's no CT on this vein here and it's not you can't really see it but that's the difference of course uh, identification ultimately relies heavily on on uh, genitalia so in the males you look at the, the fifth sternite which can come have different shapes and different types of cetacean um, Often we look at the shape of the circus and the distiphallus mostly. And the shape of the, the distiphallus is usually extremely characteristic and can often very quickly allow you to identify some of the more, uh, the, some of the species which stand out a bit more in terms of their morphology. Then there are species groups where they're very similar. So it's a bit tricky. You need to have a bit of practice and uh, have some good uh, specimens or photos to compare with. Often the colour of the epandrium also can be a good way of splitting uh, males from different groups. Um, in the females there are um, also some characters, so in the external morphology uh, many species have uh, uh, what we call a mid femoral organ. So this is the mid femur of a female sarcophaga. And there's a part of the femur which where the cuticle is thinner. So you, you see it comes across as having a different color and it's slightly striped and probably it releases some chemical substance which is use, used in sexual attraction. This um, organ comes in different shapes, sizes and positions and colors, which is usually species specific. It takes a bit of practice to find it in some species where it's less conspicuous. Sometimes it's absent altogether. So in, in this case, it's uh, no, here. It's, it's <laughs> I thought it was absent. It fooled me. No, here it's, it's very tiny. Of course, the photo is not, is not um, uh, perfect in this case. Sometimes it's very elongated and reaches across most of the surface of the femur. Um, female genitalia are also very useful for species identification. Um, so this is just a few photos to compare, just so you get an idea of how different they can look. Of sometimes dissection is needed to look at smaller details and in some groups of females it's not really possible at all to distinguish um, the species just based on morphology. Okay, and um, so regarding identification, um, as Liana mentioned in her introduction, I've been working on a draft key to British species, which now includes uh, 
most of the, the species which are currently known to occur in, in the British Isles. Um, this is still a work in progress. I uploaded it as a preprint, but uh, the plan is to do a much more in-depth uh, morphological documentation and have images, lots of images accompanying each couplet. At the moment, it's just to keep the text uh, separated from the figures at the end, but um, it can be downloaded uh, uh, for free from the OSF preprints, uh, and I can I can provide a link to it in the in the chat if anyone's uh, interested. This it's based on uh, the the foundation for this key was uh, was laid in the nineteen forties and fifties by a few workers, including uh, Van Emden, uh, but that that key was obviously very much out of date now and. Um, slightly difficult to use. Um, we recently, together with my partners in crime, Charles and Nigel, launched a sarcophagid recording scheme for the UK. So we have a, a page on the Diptris Forum website. We have a, a Facebook group, which was quite active during the spring and summer when people were out collecting and taking photos. We have a Twitter group. And since last winter, we've been actively uh, uh, verifying records on iRecord. We've also received lots of um, spreadsheets from people, so several hundred records, which we still need to carefully go through and eventually upload also onto iRecord. And as soon as um, records are verified in iRecord, it just takes a few days for them to go onto the NBN atlas and actually be come up on on a map, on the map. So it's a extremely well well designed uh, system. So with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators Charles and Nigel for um, initiating. Uh, things regarding the recording scheme and helping me with that. Diptris Forum, my museum, and and also the Tenibtra Trust for inviting me to give this uh, webinar. Steve Falk and Steen Dupont uh, are helping me um, with the key, and I would like to thank them as well. We also have several uh, records, paper records from Steve Falk, which we need to digitize and hopefully make public in the next year or so. So with that, I'm done. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, Daniel, that was that was fantastic. That was that was a really great overview of what is, yeah, an amazingly diverse group. I mean, I, I didn't realize they they went over so many different types of parasites, um, hosts, you know, I, I, yeah, earthworms and cicadas, really. Yeah, that's really uh, amazing. And the, and the list is actually much longer. And as I said, we, as some of the examples I showed uh, demonstrate that we, we know very little still. So a lot of the, the discoveries are recent and there's very few people actually uh, doing this type of work, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and I, I also flesh flies as pollinators in Chile. That's really, yeah, that's really quite. Yeah, that was a yeah. great. That was a great one to. A great discovery for me. I had no idea. I, I mean, I knew they're often listed as pollinators. Uh, you see them on flowers very often, so it's quite clear that they're pollinators. They also often have pollen on them so it's clear that they're pollinators but actually the fact that they're actually being used in a to to, to actively pollinate crops was was fantastic has anyone been looking at using flesh flies as a biological control for pest species uh yes so 
not many flesh flies have been used in biological control, but actually that's one example of uh, biology which I left out of the talk because it was getting too big. But um, a few couple of decades ago, uh, one uh, a species of snail parasitizing flesh fly was introduced to Australia to control populations of a Mediterranean snail, which had become invasive. And um, these snails, they actually, they're not a pest because they eat crops, but mostly because they kind of estivate on, in big groups at the top of plants and, and they can basically destroy farm machinery, etc. And so it's a huge problem in Australia as with many other invasive species. But um, so they introduced the Mediterranean fly to control it. So this is a fly that uh, is a naturally a parasitoid of these snails. And it was kind of successful. And there's a few papers about it. Um, and the problem was that the populations of flies gradually just died down over the years. So and, and they, they weren't as efficient as they were meant to be in controlling these snails. But recently, uh, CSIRO kind of revived the project and with a PhD uh, project in Morocco, where a student uh, and collaborators investigated different populations of this fly from across Europe, because it occurs in Mediterranean Europe and North Africa to figure out which, which population, which strain was most efficient against uh, these snails. So they, they did some molecular work, they, they did some laboratory tests. The project is still ongoing, but the plan is to introduce a more efficient, uh, a more efficient strain of, of flies to Australia. Yeah. Great, okay, we'll, we'll go to um, a question from Judy Staines now. Actually, there's, there was a couple more questions asking about biological control, and, and Judy is just adding to say, for instance, is there potential for using agria species to help control oak processionary moth caterpillars? Yeah, I would say, I don't know. So I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head uh, which species of sarcophagids feed on on the on the processionary moss, but I'm sure at least some of them do. Yes, I mean, there could be potential, but these are these projects are often very difficult uh, to, to carry out. So if, if, does Greg have something, do, Greg, do you have something to add about that? I would just mention that here in the States, early on, a number of sarcophages were looked at for controlling gypsy moths. Um, but uh, with all the new chemical insecticides and stuff, they kind of left that biological control work uh, to the side. So whether or not something like that. I also saw some work um, early on was done for Blisa zypha for controlling grasshopper pests. But uh, again, chemical control kind of took that out of the equation. Yeah, because there's there's been a, several studies on um, some basic cipher species which uh, feed on locusts, yeah. and there there are several species of flesh fly that feed on on some of these defoliating moths. So, yeah. so, so perhaps a bit of potential for the future then in biological control. Yeah, as Greg said. Uh, chemical techniques seem to really take over. Okay, um, Erica is, is, has just said there's another Flesh Flies talk on tomorrow on, on Diptus Day. So um, if you enjoyed, if you enjoyed Daniel's, then, then that might be another reason to go tomorrow. Um, I'm just scrolling through a lot of thank yous at the moment to get to another question. Um, okay, question from Richard Dawson. Um, is there any evidence or observations that flies, etc., will hilltop around 
tall buildings. Hilltop, as in. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sh really sure about buildings, but I know that they, so there's evidence that flies that do hilltop, so it's, it's mainly the males. They will also congregate, for example, at the tops of trees. So that's also been, that's been termed uh, tree topping. Um, I think I've read somewhere that they can also, they can also, um, congregate at the tops of, of buildings. Okay, a question, oh, and a related question from Donald Smith. Is hill topping collecting a good technique in the UK? Uh, there are fewer hills and usually they're in quite cold, chilly places. So, I mean, in general, uh, it's, it wouldn't be as good as in other countries in terms of the diversity, of course, but that's related to the, the slightly poorer diversity in the UK. But yes, you, I've collected on a, a hilltop in, in Cumbria and it was quite successful. I mean, I, I collected a few species which I hadn't collected in the surrounding habitat. I've I've also um, collected on hilltops locally in Shropshire, and they're always there, but I tend to um, get the same species all the time. Basically, the big three: those the sarcophaga species, Carnaria and Co. Yeah, I mean it can be easy to collect several specimens of the, of the same species on hilltops. I mean, it's it's, it's difficult to distinguish between a lot of these species just based on live specimen. Do, do yeah, they go right to the tops of the of the peaks in the UK? Nigel, maybe you Yeah, I, I think they do. Um, a couple of dipterists in Wales did uh, walk to the top of a fairly high mountain in Wales last last year or the year before, part of the dip the upland dipter group. Uh, and they found lots of flies, and I think that included some sarcophagids as well. And uh, certainly, you know, if I've been up on the tops of any quite uh, tall hills or mountains, I've, I've used, if it's been a decent day, you know, with some sun, I've usually seen them on, on rocks and things hanging about. So it's a good way, I've always thought that uh, it'd be a good project for somebody who wanted to get fit. You know, just think I'm just going to get, I'm going to have a, a hilltopping project and see what, because there are other fly groups as well, and also some of the hymenoptera you find. So it's uh, quite an interesting thing to do, and you get fit into the bargain. <laughs> okay, and another question from Linda How seasonal are they? Can we see flesh flies all year round? So they're, they're quite seasonal, they like hot weather. Um, so obviously, we're talking about the adults. Uh, Usually they they come out uh, around uh, first warm weather, end of March, early April, and then if the weather stays warm, uh, you will still find some individuals uh, until this time of year, more or less. I'd say. But then uh, the phenology changes. It, according to species. There are some species that are around throughout most of the season, usually the more um, anthropic ones adapted to like, cities and other species that have quite a short, uh, a short time as adults. Okay, a, a, a question from Rod Hill. How do you separate flesh flies from similar forms of other species? So maybe is is, is quite, Rod, are you trying? Are you asking whether how would you sort of recognise a flesh fly in the field? Is that your? You can you can unmute if you like, Rod, and, and just clarify that. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes, from um, images, photographs because they can, obviously, some are very similar, uh, including blowflies. 
Yeah, so I mean, obviously, it depends on the on the flesh fly, but the, the typical uh, black and grey ones with stripy thorax. There's a, there's actually quite a good character, which I'm not. I don't know if it always holds, but nearly always. Um, it's looking at the number of dark stripes on the thorax. So if there's three uh, very distinct dark stripes across the whole length of the thorax, then usually that's a sarcophaga. Right. species or a sarcophagian, yeah. Okay. But uh, the checkerboard pattern on the abdomen, that's quite uh, typical. And of course, it can be confused with similar gray and black patterns on, on tachinids or there's some califores like urichita, genus urichita that look, that look just like flesh flies. And then in that case, the giveaway is the color of the palps. So if you see something that looks just like a flesh fly in the UK with very obviously yellow palps, then that's uh, that's most more likely to be a urichita. But from photos, it, yeah, um, the, the, there's lots of tachinids that look a lot like sarcophagids. So it's you need a bit of practice. And, need, and with photos that are more and more higher and higher resolution nowadays, you can look out for some characters. So if you see a flesh fly looking fly with obviously hairy eyes in the UK, then you can be, you can be quite sure it's not, it's not a flesh fly. Often they're, they're, they're perceived as having very redder eyes than, than tachinids. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just on to to Kinnids, um, Ramir is just saying, is any anyone interested in them? I, uh, I would love to listen to a talk about Kinnids. So uh, people can uh, put in the in the in the chat if you'd like to hear about talk about Kinnids. We certainly we will hopefully be doing these these webinars until at least the the spring and then I'd like to think we would carry on perhaps not as uh, as regularly um, going forward obviously through the through the summer through the field season but um, I'd like to think we would, we'd carry on so there's certainly potential to do something like that on to Kinnitz. Um Okay on to a question from Bill Irwin. Do you have any experience of using baited malaise traps? Are they too effective? Very good question. Um, I do have a very bad experience with a baited malaise trap, although it wasn't, I don't, I don't know what Bill means exactly by baited malaise trap. If, I don't know if there's a way to intelligently bait a malaise trap, but once uh, it happened that we baited a malaise trap in a, in a kind of not very well thought through way. So what happened, we, this is again in Australia, everything, everything, all the fun stuff happened in Australia in my field trips. But, um, we found a dead echidna and we, we put up a malaise trap and we checked it after a couple of days and it, it hadn't collected much. So but there were a few interesting looking flies in it, you know, how you take the jar off, have a peek inside, screw it back on. And one of us, I can't remember who it was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Hey, let's, let's put the dead echidna under the Malay strap. Okay, so let's do that. So we did that. <laughs> and then we came back a couple of days later and the whole jar was completely full, plus the, the part above it and half of the trap was completely full of adults and larvae of uh, a mussid. I can't remember the, the genus. It's one of these necrophagous mussids. And there, it was terrible. So there, was, there, were la there were maggots crawling all over the, the trap. They were eating through their own parents or siblings and stuff like that. But yeah, so overkill. Wow. So yeah, it's it's generally not a good idea, I'd say. But okay, did, Greg, that... Greg, Greg, your experience, please. Have you ever baited the Malay trap? Um, 
well, sometimes we, uh, when there's no flies around or whatever, uh, human dung is often uh, deposited uh, and carried under the malaise trap that serves as a, a fairly diverse bait or whatever. Okay, but it's less dramatic because you won't have thousands of individuals emerging. No, I've never had an experience like that. <laughs> Um, Bill, was that was that answering exactly what you what you meant by baited malaise traps? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've run a few malaise traps just generally, and was thinking of uh, setting one up specifically for um, flesh flies. But um, choose your bait carefully seems to be the right idea. I think if you choose your habitat carefully, and you'll get a good diversity, or maybe keep the bait a bit far away from the trap. <laughs> if you want, right. just yeah. don't, don't just try to avoid getting everything that's emerging from your bloated carcass. Thank you. Yes, Greg. I was just going to say for the best uh, sarcophagid collecting that I do with my malaise trap is setting it up right at that border between a woods and a, a field and so that it's in the sunlight. It, sunlight is really really important and uh, getting that edge effect uh, really seems to bring in the most diversity. Yeah I agree. I, yeah I think, I think that goes for quite a few groups. Oh Nigel. I was just going to add if Bill was interested in finding sarcophagids through trapping, I'd certainly recommend um, pan trapping. I've had really good results using those in Britain and it's much easier and you don't get such huge numbers of uh, other non-target uh, specimens. Great. Okay, we'll go to an another question now. This this person's name is all one word, so I'm going to guess where it's sort of where one name finishes and another one starts here. Stefano Varnin. So, Daniel, do you have any evidence of the effects of the global warming and globalization on the sarcophagid changes in distribution? So that's a very interesting question because um, obviously we don't have any hard evidence or you know long term for these things. You need long term data, but recently a few species seem to have appeared in the UK and become established and the recording scheme hasn't really been ongoing long enough for, to ha for us to have uh, so we haven't digitized all the historical data we, we, we still have to go through lots of uh, historical collections but there are indications that a few of these species have appeared recently and become established recently so one is a species which um, was discovered this year, uh, Sarcophaga bulgarica, bulgarica, or, and it's, I mean, it's not a particularly southerly species. So it's, it's, it was known since a long time in northern France, but it seems to have come, uh, gone across the channel and have become established in the south of the UK. So a lot of these new species we're finding, we're finding them just in the south, southeast. And of course, this is based on not very much data. But it, it's possible that uh, warmer summers are favoring the arrival and possible establishment of, of some, some European species. Great. Can I can I put that to you as well, Greg? Just with your experience across the pond of any climate change, clear clear changes that are going on with the with the group. I would just say that the biggest thing that I've noticed is the lowering numbers of flies that uh, I collect in places where it used to be very very dense with flies. So I really see that sort of insect Armageddon 
Crips type thing going on with uh, Flesh Flies, as well as uh, so many other groups. Thank you. Um, okay, a question from Phil Brighton now. Do the adults overwinter or do they lay their eggs, lay their larvae in the hosts? So most of the adults, I would say they don't overwinter. So there's, there's not that many flies that overwinter as adults at our latitudes. So most of them overwinter as, I would say, as, as pu puparium in the pupal stage. But then it also depends a lot on the biology. Great. OK. Um, OK, a question from Mark Fordyce. Are there any new northward moving species to look out for in Scotland? Um, maybe you've already sort of answered that. We absolutely don't, it's not clear. But. You were, no, you, sh you should move south and you'll find more species. <laughs> uh, maybe. I mean, related. it's related to the previous question from Stefan. There, there could be. I mean, if there are trends in, you know, warmer summers further, further, further north, then maybe there will be some species moving further north. But I think there may be. I, I, we don't have enough, as I said, we, ha we don't have enough data and the, da the little data we have, we haven't really analyzed yet. We've only just started the recording scheme. But um, based on, on an, an analysis, we might be able to say that some species are moving further north. But again, we'd have to look at material from collections to see if there's a trend or if it's just something else. You need more recorders to get, yeah. get, more, get more data and uh, we understand all these things. We have, a few, we have a few recorders in Scotland and Northern England. But it's, it always seems to be those few handful of species that occur further north. Okay, a question from Dave uh, Skinsley. Um, who would we send specimens to in the UK? I don't know if that's who's, who's best to answer uh, that. That'd be me and uh, Charlie Griffiths. That's the short answer to that. <laughs> okay, and and, and 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 Nigel, do you and Charles or Charlie offer that? Um, yeah, service? sure. Yeah, we're keen. Yeah, we're keen to take specimens off people if they either want them checking or if they can't do them themselves and they've. Not as long as there's not too many, obviously, but yeah, we're quite happy to look at specimens. And is is your is your email on the recording scheme website that people can contact? Yes, you? yeah, yeah, and on Twitter, you can get, get to us via Twitter or Facebook as well. Okay, great. So, yes, Dave, the offer the offer's there. Um, Right, sorry, I'm just, just scrolling through here to, to find more questions. Um, okay, a question from Lisa Fizzler. I don't know if I missed it, but is there any use to this organ on the mid femur femur of females? Uh, probably, yeah, there has to be a use to it. Um... It probably uh, releases some chemical substance, which is used in maybe uh, recognition among individuals of the same species. But there's not much work being done on it. Okay, I'll, I'll go to a question now from Garrett Ohm, I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle with this pronunciation here. Do do Miltogramini larvae always eat the Hymenoptera eggs or larvae before eating their food supply? And I think this is the second question that, from Garrett as well, talking about Miltogramini. Is there a differentiation between kleptoparasitoids and kleptoparasites? 
Uh, um, I think there's been it's been shown that the larvae can eat the wasps' eggs uh, before they, f or at the same while feeding on the on the on the food supply. And it's been hypothesized that that's to kind of immediately get rid of the competitor. Uh, but I don't think it's been observed in in more than a handful of species, to be honest. Again, we don't know enough about these species and what they're doing and how the larvae are behaving once they're inside the nest. And the correct term should be kleptoparasite. It's just a, it's just a word. I mean, it may it might be more correct to. It's, it's, it would be incorrect to call them parasitoids because uh, they feed on whatever they find in the, in the, in the, in the, in the wasp's cell. Um, so they're more, they're more akin to predators really. But kleptoparasites because they steal, they steal their food from another species. Um, I just wanted to mention with all these people here that are interested in sarcophagids, you know, the identification can be pretty difficult, but one of the things anybody can do is give more information on the biology of these flies because we know just so little and it could be the random sick millipede that you find out in the garden if you just take that in and hold on to it and see if a fly comes out of it. Those are the kind of really special things that anybody might just serendipit serendipitously uh, run across that would really help us to understand a little bit better what these flies are doing out in the environment. Just to give an example of, of, what, of that, um, just recently a colleague, uh, contacted me who had reared two flies from a millipede, a live millipede. And it turned out to be a, one of the Mediterranean species relate, closely related to sarcophaga nig nigriventris. This was in Greece. And this, would, this is only the second record, I think, of a European species bred from millipedes. And it's the first record of the biology of that species so it's true i mean sometimes it's just down to collect collecting observing rearing actually i'm really interested in if if any of you are rearing moths i would be really interested in any records of sarcophagus from moth pupae because we know very little, for example, the earthworm parasitizing species seems to also, some of, at least one or, one or two of the species seem to also feed on moth pupae. And there seem to be more records of that in collections than, than from earthworms. But they're not, it's difficult, they're old, it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult to interpret the, the data. So the records are never, you know, hundred percent certain. So all, as well as collect and observe, also document as much as you can. Um, and and I mean that was your the video you had uh, was excellent, and and everyone's got such a good, you know, quality macro uh, camera in their in their pocket nowadays. You can really you can film these little things go these interactions going on can't you everyone can do that so easily and um, i was actually going to ask and um, with that um with the the wasp video and 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 the wasp decided there was there's too many flies around it and it went somewhere else with the caterpillar does what happens if they do do the flies just follow the wasp around or does it does does the wasp sort of wait till it thinks it's got away and uh, some of the flies, they seem very close to the hole, and I'm thinking surely the wasp sort of sees them every time. Yeah, I think the wasps are conscious, and then again, it's down to different strategies. So sometimes the flies wait around the hole, and they wait till the wasp 
because often the wasps fill these nests with more than one host, so they have to leave the nest. Sometimes the, the wasps have evolved guarding techniques, so where the one, one of the two sexes stays near to the nest to prevent flies from entering it. But um, it seems that um, the flies usually find a way in the end. Of, but I mean, they might you know, not attack that particular individual and wait for another one who's more attackable. But I'm sure, so some, some wasps get away with it, of course, and they're able to move to somewhere where they don't, their nest doesn't get parasitized. But um, I think it's, it's quite, it's quite tough. I mean, the, the, the percentages are really high, 75, 80% in some cases. So you're looking at a real high, uh, a high toll. Yeah. Um, re on a related theme, I watched a um, little miltogramin in my garden, a mobia, a signata, tailing um, a mason wasp in the genus Ancestroceros. And it, obviously, it's not possible to know for sure, but it seemed that the wasp was aware it was being tailed by this fly because the sort of flight pattern was very different. And eventually, it sort of decided that the wasp. It seemed to decide to fly through a lot of dense vegetation amongst all the uh, stems weaving and out of them, and it did manage to throw the fly off its off, off its tail. Now, whether that was deliberate or um, coincidental, I don't know. But to, you know if, if people can watch out for things like that and you get enough collaborations, you start to build a picture of what goes on. I mean, there's quite a few. There are a few papers, um, particularly on North American species, with with like really detailed uh, research on this. So, um, Spofford and Kuchevsky. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to share them with you, but uh, if anyone's interested, they can contact me privately and I can send a few PDFs. There's such, such fascinating behavior and I'm sure there's, there's so much more to, to learn as well. Um, Okay, well, if, if there's um, no more questions. Uh, I think there was, there was one from Judy Stain. Oh, there is, yes. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'll read that out. Um, I've seen sick and deformed, oh, sorry, the, I've seen sick and deformed earthworms. Is it always flesh flies that parasitize them or do other insects do so as well? So that's really interesting that you've seen them and it would be nice to have some more, inf yeah, lump, also, yeah, lumpy earthworms. And there are other flies that parasitize worms. So one very common one is the cluster flies, pollinia. They are proper parasitoids of earthworms. And in, there's slight difference in the way they feed on the earthworms compared to the flesh flies because they, in the flesh flies, several larvae can complete uh, their life cycle to the to reach the third instar, whereas in pollinia it seems that one they uh, at some stage the larva the first instar larva, after not really doing much inside the worm, migrates to the front end of the worm and and kind of occupies the front of the worm and then it starts feeding from there and gradually it grows and eats up the whole worm and in the process it kills its uh, it kills off its its siblings so usually there's just one one cluster fly that emerges per worm that's according to the literature but yeah there are other flies and there's also some i believe ragio species which feed externally on earthworms but they they i think they remain external to the earthworm they kind of latch onto them with their mandibles and just suck suck the earthworms blood or fluids or whatever you want to call it thank you yeah, eric is laughing i don't know why <laughs> i don't know if all of this is in erica's erica's book but i think there's you're going to need to write a few books at this rate of <laughs> It's really, I love hearing all of these, but it's really annoying because there's so much more information. And as Dan highlights and Greg highlights, we just need, and, and, and Nigel, 
all so much more of behavioral observations and all of these things and i would just write them down because they are pure gems of like um lumpy earthworms sucking animals dry everything the language is brilliant <laughs> thanks everyone quite brutal and then i will add that there are other species of califorids that also feed on earthworms as parasitoids <laughs> Okay, so we, we have another question that's, that's come in from John and Sally Mosley. Um, do the larger sarcophagia have a trochanter with shortened and dense setae anterior surface? Question mark. So this is on the hind trochanter. There are sometimes some modified, like shortened uh, bristles. And this varies from species to species. So some some of them have them, some don't. And that's only in the males. And that can be quite a good. Uh, it can be quite a good um, character for distinguishing species. Okay, uh, and from uh, Ramya. Pollinia parasitizing earthworm, isn't it a tachinid? So Pollinia, Pollinia used to be part of the blowflies, the Caiphorids, which is a bit of a dumping ground for groups that aren't necessarily all related to one another. But recent, recent um, research has separated them, has split them off as a separate family, which is sister to the tachinids. So in a way, yeah, if you take the common ancestor, they are the kinids, yeah. So, but they're considered a separate family. Okay then, well, I guess all that's left to do then is, is, to, is to thank Daniel um, once again for an absolutely superb overview and introduction to the, to the family. That was brilliant and such comprehensive answers to the questions and also to 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 Nigel um, and also to to Greg really for really informative answers to some really interesting questions as well from the audience.